Hello, Garland ISD family. Thank you for tuning into our Facebook Live chat tonight. Tonight, we're going to talk about the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Program. Please chat with us while you are watching. My team is here to answer your questions, and we would love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining all of us and allowing me the opportunity to speak this afternoon. As Dr. Cadell has already said, my name is Lauren McKinney and I serve as your federal programs grant manager here in the Garland ISD. Uh, prior, to, well, I've been back since January of 2020. Before that, I was over at Region 10. I was over a statewide initiative there with TEA, did some other federal programs things and some teaching and learning things. And then I was here in Garland, so I'm happy to be back again. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of the ESSERF grant of which I know you've been hearing a lot of things about. I wanted to make sure that you had the most pertinent information and really drill down in the statute so that we have big picture. What does the statute say? And what implications does that have for us as an organization as we serve our students? So let's get into it. ESSERF, you've been hearing that a lot. I like to know what acronyms mean. So just so you have this information, it's the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, a brief overview. Now, you'll hear a lot of people sometimes say ESSERF, but it's also a fund, so you'll hear me say ESSERF, it's the same thing. Uh, today is May 19th, and if you need any additional information, feel free to reach out to me as well. My contact information is there on the screen. Topics we're gonna be covering. We're gonna define the ARP Act, a little bit more of an understanding of what ESSERF 3 is, how does it apply to what we do and how we serve our students, and then we'll close out with some questions for consideration as well as resources that you can follow up with at a later time. So the first piece, who can tell me what this lovely <laughs> piece of artwork is right here? That is COVID, yes, yeah, that is the lovely thing that has been causing the uh, the state of uh, educating through a pandemic, educating in crisis mode through a crisis that we have been in since March of 2020. Now we do all know about the CARES Act. That was the first leg of additional funding, supplemental funding that organizations, school districts, everybody got a piece of when we're talking about federal funding. So the ESSERF, which we're gonna go into a little bit more detail, is not a part of CARES, it's actually a part of another plan that was signed this year. The ARP Act is the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Now this economic stimulus bill uh, was passed on March 11th of this year and it is a trillion dollars. Uh, the purpose of the ARP Act was to, and this is just my own wording, but basically hasten the economic and healthcare recovery uh, of our nation as a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic and then the subsequent recession that happened as a result of continuing to live through a pandemic. Uh, in short, it has 11 titles and Title II, which is the Committee on Health, Education, Labor and Pensions, is a section that is really specific to educational entities. Now, and if you, if the title thing sounds familiar, those of you that have served or had students that have been educated on a Title I Part A campus, uh, you're familiar with the concept of titles. Uh, that's just the title under ESSA. Under ARP, ESSER, look at all these lovely acronyms, uh, is the title that we are going to be talking about in a little bit more detail. The ERF itself is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. You'll notice that I have number three next to it. And the reason why, as we currently know, we will be getting three separate uh, funding sources under ESSERF, okay? ESSER 1, which we initially thought was gonna be the only one, but ESSER 1, we got back in the fall. Um, I wanna say we received our notification that we would uh, we were getting this grant as an organization in October, November. Our application came out earlier than that, but then that's when we were uh, formally notified that we are recipients of this funding from the Texas Education Agency. ESSER 3 is what we are looking at now. There's another one coming, ESSER 2, and the reason why we are out of order is ESSER 2 is still in negotiations right now uh, with the legislation. So we are talking about number three right now. Number one, we got it at an earlier time. Two is gonna be coming later. With this statute, the Garland ISD is going to receive a sizable allocation. What that means is that unlike Title I Part A, it is not specific to a, uh, doesn't have a specific 
required allocation for campuses. This particular allocation is a Garland ISD allocation. This allocation itself, this funding source has several components, but the two primary pieces that are gonna impact our campuses and those who serve our students and those who serve our families on the campuses is the use of funds plan, which the majority of our time together will be talking about. And then the second piece is called a safe return to in-person instruction and then continuity of services. Now the first one, fairly simple, use the funds, how are we spending the money? And that is where you come in. That is part of the reason why we're also happy <laughs> that so many people came together to give this first leg of feedback uh, when it comes to what ways you think would most benefit the students, benefit families as we continue to educate and grow through a pandemic. The safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services is what is the Garland ISD doing in order to ensure that the environment is safe for our kids, for our staff, for our families to come and engage with us uh, during the school year? So the use of funds, this is the weightiest part of this statute. Uh, it is the weightiest part because it has the, the meat. So in short, we have to, the Garland ISD, any organization that's receiving this funding source has to address learning loss through the implementation of evidence-based interventions or strategies. Now, the caveat with this one is that at least 20% of the overall allocation has to be specifically geared towards addressing the loss of learning that may have occurred as a result of us learning through, educating through, and living through a pandemic over the last year. So examples of what that could possibly be, summer learning or summer enrichment, could be some kind of extensive extended day. It could be after school programs. Uh, in short, the learning loss provision of the statute says that we have to make sure we are providing intensive academic interventions that are responding to our students' academic needs. We also wanna think about the overall social and emotional needs because as we all know, not only was uh, education impacting when we're thinking about, you know, our formal education system, but the emotional well-being, the emotional toll that has been taken, the mental toll that has unfortunately uh, occurred and been put on our students and those we serve has been significant. So this particular grant and this particular section says that at least 20% of all the funding has to go towards meeting academic needs, social and emotional needs, and making sure that our students who traditionally may have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic have their needs met, okay? It's also open to students who are considered or experiencing homelessness as well as a foster, a youth who are in foster care. So before any other funding is spent, we have to make sure we're addressing this learning loss. After we meet that 20% criteria, so 20% off of the top of the allocation. Once we've uh, implemented strategies and come up with a plan to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our students and all of our student groups individually, we also have the opportunity of looking at other ways that we can meet the social, emotional, uh, academic, and mental health uh, aspects of our students as a result of having to live and continuing to survive a pandemic. Uh, as an organization, we have to explicitly state what we are doing to meet each population's needs. We cannot just say, oh, our low income students, this is what we're doing for them. Uh, no, <laughs> statute says that we have to make sure we are specifically addressing the needs of our English learners, our Hispanic population, our Asian population, our African American population, every population that we uh, have within our organization, we have to make sure we're meeting their specific needs. And how we're gonna meet those needs is part of the reason why you all are here uh, to help guide the process of deciding how we're gonna use the funds. Ways that we could use the funds that statute has already prescripted. They're not saying we have to do these things, but they're saying the following, I think I wanna say it's roughly 18 uh, options are things that we can do. We're not limited to this, but we can do this. Strategy that we use to serve our ESSA which would be our Title I Part A, for those of you that are familiar with that program, um, and our other federally funded sources, we can use those strategies. It would be allowable. It would also be allowable to use the same things, same strategies, same interventions that we're doing with our Adult Education and Family Literacy Act. 
our special education program, our students with uh, who are our students with disabilities that are being served through that program. Uh, our CTE program, we can also use the same strategies that we're using with our students who are engaged in that CTE program with this and pay for it with this grant. We can also make sure that we are coordinating and preparing accurately and responding to COVID. And when I say preparing, uh, if something were to happen again, uh, we could use this funding to address that. Now, I haven't talked about the scope, like how long this grant is going to last, and I'll do that at the very end, but throughout, we can use this funding for that. As I've already told you, anyone who's identified as low income, our children with disabilities, English learners, racial and ethnic minorities, uh, and our students who are experiencing homelessness and foster care uh, youth can all take advantage of this. But I also want to pull out from this that we can definitely use this funding to help train and provide professional development when it comes to sanitization, minimizing the spread of infectious disease, continuing to pay for supplies to accurately sanitize and make sure that the environment, the physical space environment is safe for our students, making sure that we are continuing the continuity on the continuation of services such as meals, such as technology, such as just educational services in general, who are thinking about our migrant kiddos as well. Additional technology, we can also pay for that as well, but we wanna make sure that whatever tech is recommended that we can prove that it has substantive educational uh, benefit uh, between the students and the teacher. So it's not just buying tech for the sake of buying tech because we have the funding. It's how does this genuinely support the academic program for our students so that they can achieve academically uh, in a way that we want for them to go. This also includes our mental health services, which I've talked about already. Uh, we wanna make sure that when we're thinking about our summer learning to try to re recapture and continue to build up our students due to the environment and having to learn and grow and be educated through a pandemic, summer learning would be included in this. And then again, it circles back to what is called learning loss. So making sure that the same students we talked about before when we said you had to at least spend 20% of the funding for this group of students and explicitly state how we're meeting all of our students' needs, you can continue to pay for that with your remaining 80% uh, if we so choose to as an organization. And wrapping up the few things that we have left under use of funds, if we needed to repair our school facilities as a result of things that may have occurred during the COVID pandemic, we can do that. Uh, we can also look at replacing and upgrading some of the things we need on campuses when we're even thinking about the air quality that's going on in our campus buildings. Uh, we can also look at the development of strategies and following our public health protocols or our CDC guidelines. And then there's a little catch all at the very end that says any additional activities that are necessary to maintain continuity of services and continuity of services is just saying we want to make sure that our students are continuing to be served academically, that their mental health needs are being met, that their social and emotional needs are being met and continued despite the fact that we are still recovering as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I've gone over the use of funds section, which is a meaty part of it. I want to take a moment to make sure that you understand and truly uh, feel that it is very important, it is vital that you share your feedback. We need for you to share how it is that you would envision the district utilizing this district funding to serve our campuses and serve our students and all of our stakeholders, our parents, our families, everyone. Because federal statute mandates, it's, it's, it's explicit. It tells you what you, you must at a minimum do uh, with the funding. We wanna make sure that we are capturing all stakeholder feedback through this feedback survey. By providing this input, it'll allow us a chance to collaborate more and then guide the, the funding practices, guide the implementation practices of this program. Because this is truly a program that has funding associated with it. So to make sure we are addressing the academic, our social, our emotional needs, mental health needs of our students, this program has funding that's attached to it. Use this QR code. Uh, we have the short link here for you there for, for you to provide feedback. This survey is not closing tomorrow. Uh, we want you and we encourage you to uh, make sure that you share this feedback link. And because it's hyperlinked, it may be kind of blurring it, but it's gg.gg slash G-I-S-D underscore ESSERF. And you're gonna use that as an opportunity and a location to house where you are providing all of your feedback. 
Okay. So it, it's not being shut down in the next 24 hours. Uh, you have time, but please take advantage of it because that is how the overall organization knows what needs we have at every level and how to prioritize these needs to make sure that the things that are gonna have the greatest impact on our students, the things that are gonna have the greatest impact on their on our, our families uh, will be met through the prioritization of needs that you identify. Those priorities that you all identify, so if I were to click on that link right now and go to the priority linking survey, and if you say in here that mitigating learning loss is the high priority and, and everything in that top box is the high priority, and I like that because it's academics, right? Um, and then some of the other things like upgrading HVAC, maybe it's a medium priority, still important, but maybe not high priority. That will help us go through the laundry list of things that are already generated before we add to it other ideas and input from all of the feedback circles that we're having like this one today okay so this is just going to help us we know that we're going to generate a lot of ideas and this is intended to help us say okay all of the ideas that are aligned to this that was identified by our focus group as the highest priority areas we want to make sure that those things that are aligned to that are at the top priority of how we're going to spend the funds over the, the allocation of the year but you see, I've already pulled it up while Dr. Cadell was talking so that you could see it. It's short, it's genuinely this short. So it's just two sections. Any feedback you can provide is going to be greatly appreciated and, and truly highly valued. So getting back to this piece, uh, I am now going to transition into the second piece of the requirement for us as an organization that does impact our campuses. So the use of funds, you've already covered. And as a reminder, the use of funds, that's not everything, right? It, and honestly, with all of those different, it can be IDEA, our, our grant that serves special, uh, our students who are receiving special education services. It can be Perkins. Y'all, it, it's, it's a lot of things that could be covered under this ESSERF grant. So don't feel as though those things that are there are just like, oh, we can only do summer No, there's plenty of other things we can do as long as it supports the programmatic intent of this grant, which is to make sure that we are addressing learning loss, make sure we're addressing the holistic academic, social, emotional, mental health needs of our kids. So the second piece of this is the safe return to in-person instruction plan. Now, these two plans have to both be posted on our district site and the agency, uh, the TEA. It will be going through and looking at everybody's plans. So this second piece doesn't have as much meat to it as you've seen if you've been scrolling through a copy of this presentation, um, but it is equally important. So the Garland ISD is tasked with developing and making publicly available on our website, a plan for the safe return to in-person instruction and continuity or continuation of educational services. The CDC uh, has some recommendations that the agency has already shared with us. And this was as of April 30th uh, when I was on a, a webinar with TEA. So while we do not have to, as an organization, implement every single recommendation you see there, uh, this is what the CDC is recommending, okay? And again, if you complete that survey and prioritize the things that are of high uh, importance to you as someone who serves students and is served by the overall district, uh, this, this will help us quite a bit. So. As I said, that was really, that was it. That's it for the safe to in-person return piece. Uh, make sure you fill out that survey so we can gauge what is of high uh, priority to you with the development of both of these. So if you're serving on the campus, if you're serving in the community, if you are a part of this process, which you are, thank you again for being here today. Uh, how does this apply to you? I'm gonna tell you that. You can advocate for services that will benefit your campus. Uh, because statute requires that at a minimum, these groups of people or these roles are included in the feedback portion of designing how we're spending the funding. So the use of funds and designing the return to, you know, in school person piece, getting your feedback. So we have to have students involved in this. We have to have families, district administrators, our educators in the classroom principals, other school leaders, other educators, so students who serve disabilities who may not be tied to a specific campus, and then other school staff. All of these folks uh, are required per statute, per the law, to be a part of this process. 
So with your engagement with us, this allows Garland ISD to include all of the feedback to help guide the two plans we are tasked with creating if we are going to be recipients of this funding. So how can this grant support the services you provide? Uh, it's through your input that we can figure this out and make this happen. So as I go into closing, I wanted to uh, talk to you briefly about our address questions for consideration. So focusing your overall feedback. So I need you to take a moment to think and to ponder. What are the most important COVID related academic recovery needs that should be addressed with our ESSER three federal funds? Okay, so from an academic perspective, what is it that we need to provide in order to help pull our students back in and successfully prepare them to counteract all of the learning through and educating through a crisis and a pandemic that we have been doing since March of 2020? Here's your second piece. How would you recommend addressing our COVID-related academic recovery needs with our ESSER three federal funds? So it's two components. What do you view as the most important and how do you recommend us addressing it, utilizing this federal grant, utilizing this, this program and subsequent funding source as an opportunity to do so? So resources, come in soon. You will shortly see a, its own uh, website for Garland ISD. It's already in, in the works. Uh, for an SRF3 website. Uh, this website is going to have a bunch of additional resources, but at a minimum, it's going to have the use of funds, our finalized plan in multiple languages, because as part of the statute, uh, we have to ensure that we're providing this content in multiple languages and uh, to the extent practical, and also making sure that our families and community members uh, have ease of access with reading the plans. Uh, we also have to have the safe return to in-person instruction plan in multiple languages that'll be there. Uh, we'll also have the most recent updates to the Garland ISD implementation of the SRF3. So based on all of the feedback that you're going to provide, uh, we'll have a copy of the most recent updates, anything that changes that come along as new needs are identified. And we're also going to have an opportunity for everyone to provide continued ongoing feedback uh, so that we can evaluate the success of what we're doing with our strategies, with our initiatives uh, throughout the year, instead of just waiting to the end to say, how did we do, you know, kind of approach. We want to thank everyone for watching tonight and participating in this special presentation of the ESSER three federal grant. This is about supporting students, and we know that parents in the community are the experts on their children and the needs in the community. So we very much value your input, and we want to thank you in advance for participating in this survey. This survey closes May 31st, and the results will be shared at the GISD board meeting in June on the 22nd. If you know anyone that you think would benefit from this information or that would like to share their input on the district's needs, priorities, and how we can spend the federal grant money, please share this with them. The link will be on our Facebook page. We are at GISD Engagement, and it will also be in the description to the video on our YouTube channel. You can find us on YouTube at GISD FACE Department. Again, thank you for participating, and we hope you have a good night.